Hey Terry, there's another famous story. Uh, the housewife's favourite, Mr. Snugfit in the Grand National. Oh, housewife's favourite. Well, yes. Um, maybe not mine, but well, we shall see. Um, so, Mr. Snugfit had finished second in the National. And an unlucky second, probably. And I'd always wanted to win certain big races. The National, we always want to, we all want to win the National. So, I decided to buy the horse, which I bought, went back to source and uh, bought it and decided that if it was ridden right, and I feel Tuck, I think, was the rider for me that year, um, with any sort of luck, having finished second the previous year, we'd have every shot to win the race. Um, I might have had a pound or two each way at quite big prices, or maybe a little more than a pound or two. So. I bought the horse and it was well publicised. I was having a crack at the National, which is the hardest race in the world. Really the hardest race in the world to win. Um, you need luck, you need judgment, you need everything to go right. I mean, you know, JP tried for 20 odd years. And Tony McCoy tried for 25 years to win it, so it's not an easy task. Um, so I bought the horse, I think I paid 100,000 quid for it. And then I started to back it as if it couldn't get beat. Obviously, it's a math equation. So when you're looking at the amounts of money you're putting on at big prices, 33s, 28s, 25s, 20s, 60s, all the way down, uh, at some point you stop shoveling money on it. And the reason you stop shoveling money on it is because your relative percentage, just like the stock market, just like the warrant market, just like everything else in life, you're a relative percentage of reward and non-reward doesn't actually gel. So at that point, we have a horse that's pretty much favorite for the national. Law of expectation is that, you know, Terry's one, two or three really hard, difficult handicaps to win. And he's having a crack at the ultimate. Um, that year we were very unlucky. Mr. Snugfit didn't really get the run of the race. Uh, Phil Tuck couldn't lay up with the pace and was quite far back with two to go, which wasn't the plan. But the horse was a wonderful horse, very genuine, and he kept pushing away at it and he kept plugging away at it. And it was, it finished very, very strongly, was just beating the head for third, it was fourth. So I paid the place money and again, uh, wasn't a successful gamble, um, unless you consider two or two and a half million pound on the place money, uh, a successful gamble. Some people would, um, I did. And so uh, it was my first of two forays into the Grand National, um, neither of which have been successful. But in that regard, I think I gave it a very good shot. We had a good horse. We had the right horse to win. We had every chance to win. Um, the race just didn't pan out for us. The place money, uh, Made, the, made, made a dent in the bookies, but really wasn't where I wanted to be. You know, the golden story, the Cinderella story, as they say, would have been to have all that, to buy the horse, for Mick to be proven right, for us all to be proven right and to win the race, but nothing's perfect. But you know, philosophically in life, you have to look at the things you do and the things that you want to do. Um, and I've done many things in my life, not a lot of which has been publicized. Uh, one of those is the good I've done and the people I've helped quietly and throughout life. Um, and to which I always carry something with me. I'm a very superstitious person. And I wouldn't be the only one, talk to Frankie, he's superstitious too. So. There was a lovely couple who had a son who had a very, very debilitating disorder. And they wrote to me and uh, they asked me, could I help them because their son was gonna die? And I chose to do that quietly and without publicity and without making a big deal of it. And I paid for a life-saving operation for their son, who's now a big strapping young lad and or a little young lad, big strapping man with kids. And they really had nothing. And, uh, and in those days, I did a, a lot of this type of work. Uh, and I actually never met 
any of the people I'd helped. But they were actually a lovely couple. So when life took a turn against me, they actually wrote to me and they sent me something that I always carry everywhere I go, no matter where that is, on every occasion, which was all that they had to offer. That's what they had to offer me. So when you look at someone who is disadvantaged, who goes to someone who grew up disadvantaged for help and, and you help, and you receive years and years later something like that from someone, that's something I keep very close to my heart. And as you see, I never go anywhere without it, ever. And I think that in my life, that stood me in good stead. Philosophy, practicality, and I don't need to hold a candle to anybody for those type of things. Which is a whole other story, which we won't go into in this session, if that's okay with everybody. <laughs>